Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Astromagia conference. Happy to be here. Happy to do this presentation. This is a lot of new material for me. This is something that has been enchanting me as of late, the Milky Way, the river in the sky, the path of the souls. The name of this presentation is called Sable Crossings. Sable being black and crossings referencing, uh, as we'll get into, the point in which the Milky Way crosses the ecliptic. Um, underworld markings along the Milky Way. Underworld because these points fairly cross-culturally have been seen as both entrances and exits, uh, liminal crossroads between this world and the next, which you know, it's uh, the, the other world, the underworld, it has different names. The spirit world, uh, it doesn't go by only one name. I prefer underworld. It has a little bit more of a dramatic flair to it, I guess, but I also like other world. In many traditional cosmologies, uh, the cosmos is sort of divided into two with a, a liminal world in between, but almost like a, a sphere cut down the middle. And these crossing points are the crossroads, the movement between these two different halves of the sphere. So this is, this is the kind of stuff we're going to be getting into today. I think it's a pretty understudied part of, of astrology and star lore, considering that it's so well attested to in folklore and mythology. Uh, but we're going to get into all that. So before we begin, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is J.M. Hamadi. I have been engaged with astrology as a study for about a decade now. And I've been practicing and reading charts and futzing around with astrological magic for about half a decade now. And more and more, especially over the past few years, my focus has been on cross sections, crossroads of art and astrology. Uh, but even more than just astrology in the popular sense, focusing on the stars, perhaps you could say a more animist approach to the stars and astrology as star language as communicating with stars and not just stars once again in the popular sense, but the spirits of stars, seeing astrological practice as a form of spirit work. Uh, I read charts in a, in a more formal manner as well. And I, I have a, a fairly mundane astrological practice as well, but more and more, I'm being pulled towards things like naked eye observation and talismanic construction, which involves materials outside of lists from books and this sort of thing, trying to experiment more and more and lean into my art brain with astrology, because I think it's something that's not being done enough. And I think that there's a lot of room to experiment with astrology. Um, and as an artist and as someone who has always held art to be something that's important and, and crafting and this sort of thing, getting more and more interested in astrology, I really have become enamored with these little cracks and crevices in astrological practice where there's room for creative expression. So that's my little bit about myself. I don't have as much time as I normally would, so I'm gonna try it and move along and not go too much into any one rant or diatribe. And let's get started. There we go. So contents, our page of summary. 
So the presentation is broken down roughly into four sections. What is the Milky Way? We're talking about this thing called the Milky Way. What, what is it? The significance of the Milky Way in astrology, folklore, mythology, this sort of thing. We're gonna be talking about uh, quite a few different cultures and their beliefs about the Milky Way across time. And then these points of crossing along our familiar ecliptic, so the path of the sun, as I mentioned. And this is really where a lot of the lore and mythology that we might not be as familiar with crosses over into, I guess, the Western astrological paradigm. I'm also going to be talking a little bit about Vedic nakshatras. Um, but in general, I'd say the, the crossing over into the Western paradigm, we really see it along these, these crossroads. The path of the sun, which is so familiar to us in Western astrology, right, where the, where the zodiac emerges from. Uh, so much of our astrology being based on the path of the sun in this way. So these points of crossing between the Milky Way and the path of the sun um, being a way for us to better familiarize ourselves with these, these more, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, foreign elements in astrology and the astrologies of other cultures. And then to cap the presentation, the significance and magic and potential magics of these crossroads. So it's not something I'm going to go into crazy amounts of detail about. I'm going to kind of cover um, a little bit on what, what I think is more meaningful, perhaps less meaningful, and some of the magical inroads here and potential magical inroads here. Um, I, I kind of like to leave these things a bit ambiguous. Once again, as I, as I emphasized in the introduction, to leave room for personal experimentation, which a lot of people don't like, of course. Most people prefer to be able to open up a book and read, oh, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you're supposed to buy. This is what you're supposed to have, rather than... Um, you know, approaching it from a more creative or experimental vein. But I like to leave a lot of these things open to leave room for that instead of just saying, go out and do this thing, or this is how you do this thing. Um, some people will like that. Some people won't. That's just sort of the way that I do things. But yes, the significance and magic of these points of crossing. So what is... The Milky Way. The, Mil uh, the Milky Way is a galaxy, right? It's our galaxy that our solar system is found in. So the river that is the Milky Way being the view of that galaxy from our vantage point within it. That's important because so much of, of what we're going to be talking about and so much of astrology in general, frankly, is about perspective and vantage point. Um, you know, where, where, where are we viewing something from? So importantly, situated at the center of this galaxy is a supermassive black hole. This is also something that I'm astounded people don't talk about more uh, in astrological dialogue. So for astrological purposes, the anti-center is also important, right? Because in astrology, we're always working with oppositions and contrasts. We see this in the zodiac, Aries, Libra, Capricorn, Cancer, on and on, where the nodes, of course, we're always working with opposition points. So even though the anti-center to this the center of the galaxy, which is a supermassive black hole, is not a star in particular. It takes on a point of relevance, which is it's something that I tend to go on and on about. But I think another under-recognized part of astrology is the fact that we are so often working with intangibles. We're so often working with abstracts, uh, 
discovered in the darkness of the night sky with, with points that we cannot point to, things that don't exist in the same way that a shining planet does, you know, looking up in the sky and seeing Jupiter shining. Uh, so much of what we're doing in astrology is not about something necessarily visible in that way. So I like to emphasize that as well as pointing to things like black holes, which are actually kind of the negation of space, right? That we can talk about these things in astrology and these things have relevance in astrology. We'll see more about that, especially in different iterations of, of Milky Way lore, uh, especially when we get to the Southern hemisphere. So as well, every visible star in the night sky can be found in the Milky Way galaxy. Seems like a simple thing, right? Seems almost common sense, but that's huge, right? So if we're talking about this, this entity called the Milky Way, every visible star in the night sky is found in the Milky Way. So the entirety of astrological praxis and everything that it's based on is contained within the entity that we call the Milky Way. The equator of this galaxy or, or the galactic equator is the line formed by the plane of this disc shaped, um, I think that should be galaxy, but I like gallery too. Actually, <laughs> as an artist, I like gallery, which is distinct from the rotational plane formed by the sun, which is the ecliptic, right? All of this being relative from our location and viewpoint on the planet Earth. So we're working with planes always in astrology and specifically in what we're talking about here, the intersections of planes, which from our vantage point, they look like roads. Looking at a disc or a saucer from the side looks more like a straight line across. So this is the kind of spatial thinking we need to get into because there's a lot of weird spatial things happening with cross sections of roads, which are, which are actually three-dimensional disks and whatnot. Um, not that this is something that all has to be uh, you know, precisely understood in the, in the context of this presentation, but to begin to at least get into that kind of spatial thinking. So we have two images here, the image on the left and the Earth's rotation around the sun within the scope of the greater Milky Way galaxy, the Earth faces out towards the anti-center of the Milky Way. So the winter solstice point has the sun closer to center and Earth away from center. This is why it's good to get into that spatial thinking. The next slide will elaborate on this a little bit more. But remember the, the sun, the, the earth is rotating around the sun, right? So in this instance, the earth is facing out towards the anti-center at our winter solstice. And to make it even more confusing, the, su the southern hemisphere is in their summer solstice, right? And then vice versa for summer solstice in the northern or southern hemisphere. So the cyclic patterning within the galaxy may be thought of as a macrocosmic movement, the movement of the sun and the earth, a macrocosmic and then microcosmic within the context of the greater galaxy of the soul itself, birth to death, death to birth. So the image on the right, in removing the bottom of the earth, right? That's sort of the vantage point of the image on the right. In removing the bottom of the earth, we see the cyclical disc-like structure of the galaxy as a kind of womb or Ouroboros. And the point on the Ouroboros is important as we'll soon see. So this is a little bit uh, of an elaboration on the two previous images. So on the left, um, I think it's important to note the arms of the galaxy. Many of them are named after well-known constellations. Of course, if you look, you can see, and it's a little bit hard to see the image on the left because it's smaller, but you can see maybe Perseus arm. And right above that, 
where the little arrow is. It also says Orion. And then right to the upper left of the center, I think you can actually see my arrow in the screen share. Um, it says Sagittarius arm here. So these arms of the Milky Way are, many of them are named after well-known constellations because once again, all the visible stars in the sky are contained in the Milky Way. But you can get, uh, you can get a bit of an idea here, uh, even about our familiar zodiac, right? Where Perseus is on the, what we think of as the spring end of the zodiac, right by Taurus and Aries in that part of the sky, and then Sagittarius being on that autumnal going on winter end. And then interestingly enough, you can see between the arms here, actually, the parts of the sky and even in the zodiac that have less stars in them. So in a lot of, I'm, I'm pretty big on lunar mansion lore, a lot of the lunar mansions or portions of the sky that are thought to be emptier are actually because they are in between these different arms of the Milky Way. And you can see that very visibly here. So on the right, we have the, the view from the side of this disc or this plane, which the image on the left is from above, right? Wherein if you have the sun here, remember the earth rotates around the sun, lest we forget. The winter sky or the winter solstice in the Northern hemisphere being the earth, to the left of the sun here, where the sun is closer to galactic center, where that supermassive black hole is at the center of the galaxy. And then the reverse in the summer solstice in the Northern hemisphere. We're gonna be talking a lot about Northern hemisphere stuff, a little bit about the Southern hemisphere, but I'm mostly gonna be referring to these things from a Northern hemisphere perspective. Um, that's obviously my bias and most of us are living in the Northern hemisphere, but if you are coming at it from a Southern hemisphere perspective, just reverse it. Um, the, the direction, the placement of the earth in this schema is still going to be the same, uh, for, as we can see here, the winter sky or the summer sky, the solstice will just be reversed to winter or summer depending on the hemisphere. But we can see the, the winter sky, as the arrow is pointing out, has the earth facing out towards the anti-center, out away from the Milky Way galaxy to what exists beyond the Milky Way galaxy. Whereas the summer solstice, the summer sky, has the sun facing out in the direction of the winter sky, away from the center, and the earth facing closer to center. So this is that interplay of earth and sun or soul and material body, however you sort of want to break it down. And this interplay between the two function in the same way that these crossroads do that we're talking about, right? Between terrestrial or you could say, you know, phonic or earthy phenomena and uh, this more immaterial phenomena uh, the sun as the soul, right? And the movement between these within the greater womb that is the Milky Way is what we're talking about here. So constituent matter, a river of nourishment. I've pulled a few quotes from one of my favorite websites, a Constellation of Words, and they just pull a ton of star lore from all over. Uh, if it's if you haven't, if you're not familiar with that site and you're into star lore, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, so from a Greek or Hellenic context, another account of the origin of the Milky Way is that in classic folklore is marked out by the corn ears dropped by Isis in her flight from Typhon. One account of the origin of the Milky Way, the Via Lactea, 
is that Hera, Juno, was tricked by her husband, Jupiter Zeus, into breastfeeding Hercules as a baby while she was asleep in order to get Hercules' immortality. When Hera awoke and realized who he was, the illicit son of her husband, she immediately tore him from her breast, causing a smear of milky droplets across the sky from the Milky Way. Another account says it was the milk of Rhea, Saturn's wife. The Milky Way, others say, that at the time of Rhea brought to Saturnus the stone, pretending it was a child, he bade her offer milk to it. When she pressed her breast, the milk that was caused to flow formed the circle which we mentioned above. So I want to note the importance of the Milky Way with nourishment, with birthing whether it be the liquid foodstuffs of milk or the granular foodstuffs of corn or grain, the mythology and folklore is well established in this capacity. Using the connection to food and the Maya, um, the, the Mayan culture, the Mesoamerican culture is one of our primary guides here. We also see that the Milky Way is connected to life cycles in general and the Mesoamericans believing that the maize plant both constituted and represented human beings. Um, and that this, this whole cyclical model that we're talking about in Mesoamerican culture was seen as the death and rebirth of the maize plant, which we're gonna be talking about a lot in this presentation, just to give a little added context that uh, I didn't at the beginning, beginning of the presentation. My family is from Yucatan in, in Mexico, and I have a lot of Mayan uh, ancestry and folkloric elements going on in my life. And that's something that absolutely uh, will be a guide through this particular presentation has been a guide in others and is something that I'm uh, endlessly fascinated with and um, will go on and on about. So a Cherokee legend, a Native American legend, the giant dog ran across the black night sky until it disappeared from sight. But the cornmeal, the cornmeal, right, that had spilled from its mouth made a pathway across the sky. Each grain of cornmeal became a star. The Cherokees call that pattern of stars the place where the dog ran. So again, the constituent matter, these foodstuffs, as well as those classic psychopomps, the dogs, right? The Cherokees say that the entryway to the path of souls is guarded by two dogs, Sirius and Antares, where the pathway is accessed on opposite sides of the horizon. These are these two crossroad points that we're talking about. That's where the Milky Way meets our world, but you'd better be sure you've brought along enough food to offer them. I love this bit, or they won't allow you to pass, right? There's some Cerberus like, action going on here, guardian, uh, uh, canine guardian to the uh, underworld. So like the Lakota hand constellation story, which we're gonna talk about, this is a lesson to remind you that you must always remember to make your just offerings to the gods when you are alive, or things might not go so well once you're dead, I'm saying it in very plain language. Uh, most important of all, you will need to time your trip carefully so you won't miss the doorway that gives you access to the Milky Way. If you jump too early or too late, you'll fall into the water and land in the beneath world. The beneath world here being distinguished from the underworld or the other world, let's say. So there is some variation in that. Uh, the window of opportunity is still available only for a few minutes each night when the Milky Way lies low in the sky nearly parallel to the horizon. So feed your ghost dogs, people. We're also introduced here to the notion of moving along the Milky Way, right? The Milky Way is the road, the path of souls with these emphasized points of transition. So when I spoke at the beginning of the talk about this emphasis on absence, or 
seeing what we think of as negative space, the darkness in the sky, the darkness between the stars, between stellar objects and constellations as something that we can and should talk about more in astrology. Uh, I think that this is the best example. So the Yana Fuyu or the dark cloud constellations of the Inca are a series of forms clustered around the Milky Way. This is Southern hemisphere stuff. We're talking about the Inca in modern South America often relating to seasonal and life cycles in the Andes region. For example, the Atok or the Fox is a dark space crossing the ecliptic between the Western tail of our modern Western constellations, uh, Scorpio and Sagittarius, is said to rise at the same time period that foxes are born. So as the sun rises in the Southeast with the constellation of the fox around the December solstice, terrestrial foxes are born on the earth. So we see more of the connection between life cycles in the Milky Way, right? Interestingly, from a Southern hemisphere perspective, um, I think that uh, the, the Yanafuyu are a wonderful example of the extremely chthonic roots of astrology and astrology being able to speak to uh, life cycles, agricultural cycles, life and death in general, something which I think has been lost on, on a lot of modern astrology. But if you wanna hear that rant, uh, maybe you should attend the panel that me and Cadmus and Sasha Rabich are doing tomorrow. I'm gonna have a little sip of water. I'm seeing nothing in the chat. Cool. We press on. So I wanna briefly focus on serpentine symbolism, often seen in that of the ecliptic as well, but most importantly in these celestial pathways, right? They look like giant snakes in the sky and their intersections therein. So we also see this with eclipse cycles and the nodes as well. Um, my friends, Elodie and Chris are presenting, I believe today, they're presenting in, in the conference on the nodes and the serpentine symbolism of the nodes. So be sure to check that talk out, uh, but that is aligned with what I'm talking about here. These cross points, which eclipses are, right? Uh, the pathway of the moon and the sun in this way. This is the same thing that we're talking about and oftentimes the serpentine symbolism that accompanies it. So you can see it visible, visibly here in this Aztec sunstone, the calendar stone as it's called. The Aztec creation myth recalls the setting of the sky through Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl becoming world trees to provide support. So the structure of the universe is built on these intersections of the planes, right? I mean, astrology absolutely is. In this process, the Milky Way is formed as a path through the wilderness of the stars. In a similar myth, these same two gods form a band around the fifth creation, which is the world or the world that we know to shape it. This band takes the form of a double-headed dragon seen in the stone, sunstone to the right. Serpent waterways, the snake river of sparkling dust, the stream of the abyss on high through which it turns, the golden cord of the heaven god some beautiful language, connected alike with the hill of the sun god and with the passage of ghosts, is the Milky Way, and it is the river of Nana, wife of the heaven god, as in Greek mythology, it is connected with Hera. Among the Arabs, it was Al-Nahr, the river, a title that they afterwards transferred to the Greek constellation Eridanus, and those other Semites, the Hebrews, knew it as Nahr de Nur, the river of light, 
but the rabbi Levi recurred to the Akkadian simile in saying that it was the crooked serpent of the book of Job. Usually, however, in Judea, it was Arok. In Armenia and Syria, Arosea, not a lexicon word, but evidently from Aruha, a long bandage and well applied to this long band of light. In China, as in Japan, it was Tinho, the celestial river. So note the serpent's shedding of the skin and its connection to life and death cycles as well. That's another way that the serpentine symbolism emerges with the Milky Way in particular, right? We're talking about life and death cycles and no animal has embodied this quite like the serpent. So here is a, a small connection of uh, a collection of Native American lore around the Milky Way as a path to the other world or the road of spirits, the path of souls. At the top, we have the Pawnee. To the priests, however, the Milky Way was the pathway of departed spirits. A Pawnee constellation located next to the Milky Way depicts two men carrying a third in a stretcher, a sick or a dead man being taken along the road. There's actually similar symbolism in nakshatras um, with the Bhadrapadas as well. And you, and you see this fairly cross-culturally, certain constellations or star lore around um, uh, bodies being carried away on stretchers, crematories, this sort of thing. Um, from the Sioux, a uh, more testament to the Milky Way as a ghost road. They go until they meet an old woman who judges the soul's life on earth and sends it on the other world or back to earth to be a shade. We'll see uh, in a few slides that there's also this notion on this Milky Way path of encountering a final boss-like character for many, many cultures or some sort of judge. I mean, we're oftentimes familiar with this notion in the Egyptian weighing of the heart, uh, but some kind of afterlife judge, right? This being absolutely applicable to the Milky Way. And then I love this, the light in the Milky Way is the campfires of ghosts on the road. The Shoshone, um, the spirits of the dead are said to rise straight through the air to the Milky Way and travel southward to the end of the trail. So this is moving along this path, right? Some say that below the Milky Way is another earth like this one of ours, but with more abundant grass and flowers. So like we saw in the previous slide uh, about other, other world phenomena, let's say, um, sometimes being watery, sometimes being like fields or grasslands, this sort of thing. It's going to vary, but it isn't only just the path. There's other things happening in other places where the soul might fall or beautiful things that the soul might become enamored with and get lost in uh, distractions of various kinds, the meeting with various sorts of entities and whatnot. Uh, in a visionary account of the Seneca, tribe member Handsome Lake. Suddenly as they looked a road, the Milky Way slowly descended from the south sky and came to where they were standing. Now thereupon, he saw the tracks of the human race going in one direction. The individual stars were all different sizes from small to great. This road, which they soon were treading themselves, was the path by which human souls ascended into the afterworld. On it could be observed in various situations, many different types of people striving heavenward and from its vantage point, a vast panorama of human scene, human scene could be observed, of the human scene could be observed. So visionary experience. Crossings. This is an image that I found of a, a Mayan cross. I believe it's Chorti. I'm, I'm actually forgetting. I believe it's Chorti Maya cross. So the Mayan cross symbolizing a place of birth. In particular, we'll be talking a little bit more about it. Our modern 
Western constellation of Orion, or not modern, but the constellation familiar to us as Orion, for the Maya being a place of rebirth, the rebirth of the maze god, which is the cracked turtle shell, uh, as well as the hearthstone stars, uh, the center of the hearth for the Maya people, these three stars in what we know as Orion. But this cross symbol being important for the Maya in many respects, uh, being representational of birth as well as immortality, as well as in a slightly more modern context, that of rebellion. Uh, in Yucatan, the cross being a symbol of rebellion during the caste wars. Um, so indigenous people of the Yucatan rising up against uh, the plantation system and uh, the murder and enslavement of their people. So the cross being seen as a symbol of rebellion in this context. This one being decorated, or many of them are decorated in evergreen pines, the evergreen being a symbol of immortality, right? It remains green. And then because I am a florist, I couldn't help but notice the archway of bromeliads as well as the Helenconias. And doing a little bit of research about this image, I found out that Helenconia leaves are actually used as wrappers for food and tamales, which um, I guess a lot of things can be used in that context. Uh, banana leaves are, are something that people are sometimes familiar with, but that connection to nourishment and food and corn. Remember corn being uh, constitutive. Corn, we, we human beings are made of corn. We are like the corn. Um, there really is no difference in the Mesoamerican cosmology between the human being and corn. And then the bromeliads, um, I'm thinking of air plants and also being able to live off very little water, um, not only being beautiful, but sort of being another representation of immortality and being foodstuffs in many instances, fruit, pineapples are bromeliads. Another connection that I wanna point out with the cross is that, and we'll be talking more about the world tree, but in particular, in the Mayan cosmology, the Seba was considered to be the world tree and the flowers growing along it. So we can see here, you know, the Helenconia is uh, dangling from the cross, as well as the bromeliads surrounding it. But the flowers growing along and up and down the world tree to represent the souls of people, right? Flowering, blooming and as, as well as dying, appearing and disappearing along the trunk of the axis, which is the world tree, as well as the Milky Way. So today we still can see the sun at winter solstice, the year's most prolonged period of dark time, diving into the place where Pakal is interred beneath the temple of the inscriptions. In this architectural hierophany, the plunging sun is Pakal, beginning his descent into the underworld as he takes his first steps on the temporal road to his resurrection. So I enjoy musing on Pakal, also known as Eight Ahau, which is his astrology name, actually, um, because he's been, and his, his tomb, the, the lid to his sarcophagus, has been talked about so much by alternative theorists and conspiracy theorists in the ancient aliens movement and whatnot uh, as being a spaceship and he's maneuvering the spaceship with his hands and there's this whole nuts and bolts mechanical element to it as it's often portrayed. But I also like this notion of him as an astronaut, right? As, as someone moving through space, because in this instance, as we will see, he is not only falling down the world tree into the underworld, this sarcophagus marking the time of his death, 
uh, and, and the movement of his soul during the winter solstice, but uh, his, his movement in space, right? Uh, thinking about this from a, a celestial point of view, he is very much an astronaut, right? So to go a little bit deeper into the, the Mayan lore, some contemporary Maya groups regard the Milky Way as a great celestial roadway. The Chorti Maya, for example, call it the Camino de Santiago, or the Way of St. James, the network of paths in Spain that pilgrims take to reach the shrine of the Apostle St. James. So this is a very, very well-known uh, road of pilgrimage that goes back into medieval Europe, which stretches across Europe, maybe the well, most well-known road of pilgrimage um, in all of Europe. And it's interesting getting into uh, Santiago or St. James lore as being uh, the one who is along the river and his symbol being the scalloped shell. Right, there's a, a strong there's a strong symbolism of shells and entities represented by shells in Milky Way lore, which we're not going to get too much into. I've talked about it briefly in other presentations, but um, just because it mentions it here, I figured I would say that Saint James is very much associated with um, those who dwell along the river. Right, and so this being the Milky Way connection, and then also, you know, he who's represented by the shell, as well as being witness to uh, the rebirth of Christ, one of the few witnesses um, to, to this rebirthing act, which is a, is a theme that we've been talking about again and again in this presentation, right? So they pay particular attention to its alignment in the sky relative to the position of the sun. Other Maya groups describe the Milky Way as a celestial river that carries the canoe of the paddler gods and first father, our creator, into and out of the underworld, Shibalba. A design pattern in Maya art and sculpture that comes from the Popol Vuh, or Book of Counsel features the Milky Way and its creation story. The Zodiac is depicted as a two-headed serpent, like we talked about with the Aztecs, and the constellations positioned at one of the locations where it crosses the Milky Way are identified as especially important. That's where Orion, Taurus, and Gemini meet. The action begins with the lighting the three stone hearth, which I mentioned, which you'll recall is the lower region of Orion, including the Orion Nebula, by first father who was reborn out of the shell of a cosmic tortoise, the one sketched out by the belt of Orion. He raises the great world tree, another Milky Way designation, which first takes the shape of a crocodile. The Pleiades represent the handful of seeds that once planted will grow into the fertile world tree, the portion of the Milky Way arising from the cosmic fire that passes prominently through the north-south overhead zone a few hours after the Pleiades have crossed the zenith. Each year, the creation clock is rewound and the story retold. We're, talk we're talking about cycles. So archaeological findings of ancient Maya writing and sculpture bolster the sky genesis story. Bone carvings from the ruins of Tikal depict a pair of gods, jaguar paddler and stingray paddler, as, des as described in the Popol Vuh. They are shown guiding their canoe over the Milky Way and route to the place of creation, transporting their passenger, the sprouting young maize god, as the Milky Way rotates from its erect north-south orientation to the guise of the world tree, to its east-west position lower on the horizon, where it becomes the subterranean cosmic monster, or crocodile, the story of the world's creation plays out for viewers on Earth. Just a random little digression because it's coming to my mind and I've been absolutely saturated in this stuff. Getting more into Yoruba or West African uh, Egungun cults and their practice around the dead. I was reading recently that um, the, the 
Coffins are shaped as canoes and the rituals are done alongside the river. So this canoe symbolism also coming up for Sirius, Sirius being the dog, but also a star that lies uh, along the Milky Way, oftentimes being called the canoe star. Um, and this connection with the dead and even shaping the coffin in the shape of a canoe to, to move along that river of the dead, right? Um, but here, let's talk a little bit more about the world tree and its connection to the Milky Way, because these things are often conflated. So the great image of Pakal's sarcophagus at Palenque so this is the one that we were just looking at, the sarcophagus lid, the astronaut, shows him at the moment of his death falling down the world tree into the maw of the earth. The expression the ancient Maya used for this fall was ochbi, he entered the road. The road was the Milky Way, which is called both the Sak Bay, the white road, or Shibal Bay, the road of awe, or the road of fear by the Maya. Pakal enters this road, upon death. So we see Pakal's fall with a background to it, right? This world tree that he's falling along. Instead of a road or waterway, we sometimes see the Milky Way depicted as a tree, often in its vertical manifestation. So from north to south, because the Milky Way, once again, we're talking about vantage point, the Milky Way can sometimes be seen from uh, north to south, as well as an east to west. It, it moves in the sky in the way that it's, it's visible or not. So in previous presentations, I have briefly touched on the American Northwest indigenous peoples and their characterization of the Milky Way in tree-like form, oftentimes with some quote unquote, final boss type character perched atop. So here in this instance, we see Itsamye or seven macaw of the Popol Vuh as a demiurgic figure in the Popol Vuh or in uh, the mythology of the Maya, in the Kiche Maya specifically, the Popol Vuh. Uh, Seven Macaw is a demiurgic figure who believes that he is the sun and the hero twins who are these hunters and ball players come along and kind of shoot him off of his pedestal in the mythology. But oftentimes this tree or some critical point along the Milky Way road or river, some in intimidating entity is thought to exist who will judge the soul or um, stand before the soul and its movement. We see that with or s or s similar notions of uh, an entity or a creator deity of some kind standing in the, in the way of this pathway sometimes. So before transitioning into some of the correspondences in Western and Vedic astrology, as well as astrological magic, I do want to expand a little further on the idea of the pathway, which is frankly explicit in American star lore in particular. So though the origins of these beliefs is an ongoing discussion in folklore, in academia, with potential, uh, potential connections to continental Asia and shamanic beliefs, so this movement along the Bering Strait into the Americas, right, as well as a kind of proto-Orphism. The lore regarding the path of souls shares remarkable similarities among its American iterations. So I think one of the more intriguing iterations is found in Mississippian iconography, which an example which one example you can see here. The Mississippian culture is characterized as Native American civilization located in the Midwest, Eastern and Southeastern United States, roughly 800 to 1600 AD. Perhaps most importantly, being known by their mound structures. 
these mounds oftentimes containing burial complexes, which would later be dug up to reveal important iconographic monuments, ceramics, sculptures, this sort of thing. For our purposes, this iconography seems to point to a complex set of ritual and mythological beliefs based in stellar lore. One prominent example of this can be seen in the hand-eye motif pictured here. Curiously, we also see the intertwining of the serpents, right, that we've been talking about. Um, the hand-eye motif and its stellar characteristics have been documented and known to this day by Plains tribes from the Hidatsa, the Arapaho, Lakota, and many others. But the exact location of what we think of as a constellation or what many of them think of as a constellation or a sign of sorts is still debated in various, once again, folkloric or academic circles. Polaris and the pole star also being offered up as an alternative region where this sign of the hand and the eye or the hand and the dot might exist. Yet most commonly the association with the constellation is with what we know as Orion again. So more often than not, this region is seen as a portal or an entryway or what lay beyond the hand of this powerful creator deity or this powerful being because the hand belongs to some sort of uh, powerful entity in the different stories. So this pathway which the souls are attempting to move down is sometimes blocked or it, it lays beyond this hand of the deity, kind of a manifestation of this demiurgic figure that we've been, that we talked about with the Maya who sits perched atop the tree, um, but also as a portal unto itself. Jay, so, sorry, just to interrupt, just to let you know that you're an hour in now, so there's half an hour left. Okay, thank you. We don't have uh, too many more slides. Okay, so, cause I do wanna leave time for some questions. So whether it's an eye or simply a dot is also something that's been a point of, a point of contention. Um, yet this notion of a portal is fairly well agreed upon. So recall that this is the location in the Mayan cosmology of the rebirth of the maze god. We're talking about the region known as Orion, the place of the hearthstone and the cracked turtle shell. A place of dying or a place of birth, is it both? a place of rebirth, you know, wh where does this path lead to? Uh, where does it go? To the underworld? Um, to the other world? Yes, but what are, uh, what are some more familiar characteristics in the Western and Vedic astrology that we are perhaps more familiar with? I'm going to talk about now to kind of wind down. So, Briefly, the winter and the summer solstices, right? In, in Neoplatonic thought, Cancer and the summer solstice being thought of as the gate of men, or you could think of as the gate of, of birth, birth into this world. Cancer being uh, the birthing canal and Capricorn, the beginning of Capricorn being the winter solstice or what is thought of as the gate of the gods. So kind of an exit point, the exit out of this world. And these solstitial points being even in the, the Western astrological lore being important exits and entrances. So to get into the nakshatras, uh, re remember we're talking about the points of crossing, but I'm gonna, I wanna keep reiterating that. We're talking about the points of crossing between the ecliptic, the path of the sun and the Milky Way, marked by 
the region of the sky where Orion and Sirius closer to what we think of in the northern hemisphere as the spring portion of the sky and then the other point of crossing being what we think of as the autumnal moving towards winter solstice portion of the sky these being these points of crossing right so on the left we have the goddess Niriti or Rudrani or Kali representing the nakshatra Mula so this is the nakshatras are lunar mansions which are associated with particular asterisms in Vedic culture and extremely ancient and, and well attested to. If, if you weren't familiar with what a nakshatra is, it, it is a lunar mansion. So it's a division of the movement, the lunar zodiac, the movement of the moon into 27. 27 or 28. So the particular nakshatra that we're talking about, ruled by the, de the deity Nidhiti or Kali, is on this autumnal moving towards winter solstice end, just, just before the winter solstice, the, the gateway to the, the winter solstice. And in this way, the death giver or one of the death givers. On the right, we have her counterpart, right? Because we're talking about counterparts and oppositions, polarities. Rudra or Shiva representing the nakshatra Ardra. So this is the, the Orion point. The Orion portion of the sky is the other crossroads. Both, both deities very much associated with destruction of some sort being, uh, for lack of better terms, masculine and feminine polarities of, of a destructive force. So being the corresponding lunar mansions for the winter and summer solstices, respectively, it is also interesting to note that the nakshatras which follow these two correspond to the state after having passed through. These nakshatras are Purva Ashada, ruled by the deity Apas, which is water, rivers, of course, Milky Way waters and river systems, and Punarvasu, ruled by the deity Aditi, the mother of the gods, which is also the birth canal and the bow and the quiver. The bow and the quiver in Vedic culture being representative of um, life and death or regeneration. The archer shoots the bow and the arrow is retrieved and brought back into the quiver and the representation of this as a cyclical process, right? So briefly on the Deccans, I know we're running out of time. Uh, the deity is associated with the Deccans. So the list I'm working from is the Ostanis list because there are multiple lists of Deccan rulers. Um, there's actually quite a few, but the, the list I'm working from is the Ostanis list. And we're talking again about the summer solstice and winter solstice points. The summer solstice area associated with uh, praxidike, which is a form of Persephone, and the winter solstice area associated with ananke. So praxidike and Persephone, certain underworld connotations, right? Praxidike being uh, a harsher form of per uh, Persephone, who is a judge, right? this notion of the soul being judged as it's entering, exiting, or on the road of souls. And Ananke being uh, sort of in the milieu of the Titans with Kronos not as Saturn, but as a representative of time, Kronos as time being distinct from uh, Kronos as the deity Saturn. And Ananke being, as you can see in the image, aligned with this world tree, right? This, this cosmic axis or center, which everything else is spinning upon. And her being the ruling deity, I think is, is appropriate for this winter solstice point associated with the sun in closer to this, 
uh, giant black hole at the center of the galaxy being the galaxy's axis, which everything else spins upon. So we have the Arabic lunar mansions here. On the left, the planet Mars, and on the right, the planet Saturn. So the Arabic lunar mansions maintaining much of the previous lore, as well as emphasizing the lunar nodes and the malefic planetary deity Saturn and Mars, respectively. So in the Arabic lore and in um, the spirit associations with the lunar mansions. Most importantly, there are letters related to particular lunar mansions, which do change. It's not one set system, but in Arabic magic, the letter associations are important with the lunar mansions. And the letter associations with these same particular lunar mansions, once again, those aligned with the roughly the winter and summer solstice just before in this instance are the letter Zain, which um, in the angelology and in the jinn lore in, in, um, in this same body of folklore is associated with the planet Saturn and uh, Maimun, the Jinn of Saturn and Saturday, falling along the same Orion region or the summer solstice portion. And then Mars associated with the letter Sheen or the, you know, the fire which burns everything, uh, the all-consuming fire related to the winter solstice point and the, the letter Sheen being related to Samsama'il, the angel of Mars, as well as um, the Jinn al-Ahmar, which is the red, also related to the planet Mars and the reddening and the burning. So to end, magical possibilities. Right, so what are, what are some potential magical approaches with what we've learned around the Milky Way? Ways to incorporate this into an already existent practice, already existent practice, new practices, this sort of thing. So the Deccans, the lunar mansions, the nakshatras, I know we sort of flew through that. Planetary deities, um, that's something which maybe I'll talk about more in some future presentation or reach out to me about separately. I also talk about these things in a lot of other presentations and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, just the traditional magical associations with these parts of the sky, right? Um, the, the previous slides, like who are the ruling deities of these parts of the sky in Western astrology that are associated with the crossing points of the Milky Way and the ecliptic and exploring how to uh, work with or commune with these entities that are thought to rule or reside in these portions of the sky. Timing techniques using the movement of the sun, moon, ascendant, and other celestial bodies nearby or in conjunction with these points. So seeing these as points in a chart, perhaps, or even in visible space, you know, with the ascendant being looking upon the eastern horizon, right, the, the ascendant, um, and engaging with these points and with these celestial objects or celestial entities um, and, and watching them, observing them and potentially experimenting with their movement through these parts of the sky that we've been talking about. Wherein so much of what we've been looking at is timing the movement of the soul through these crossroads to better assist the soul in the afterlife journey. Exploration of magical possibilities with the associated asterisms. So all of these asterisms uh, and so many more, but in particular, these ones we've been talking about, Orion, Sirius, Antares, parts of Sagittarius associated with these crossing points. 
and exploring them on the zodiac. Once again, the movement of celestial bodies through these particular or being near to these particular asterisms. All of these are potential ways of exploring not only the Milky Way crossroads, but really the Milky Way itself through our more familiar avenues in Western astrology. And then, as I said at the very beginning and always emphasize, explorations through vision, imagination, art, and journeying, as well as oneric possibilities. So, you know, follow your natal chart and the movement of your moon, the ascendant, the sun, through these same points and see how they manifest in dreams, see how they manifest in the, the entities, the spirits that you meet in dreams crossing these places, right? Think about talismanic possibilities wherein you can craft talismans dedicated to these entities who are thought to dwell at these crossroads points and put those under your pillow as your moon is moving through these same points. This is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. You know, do automatic writing or drawing as the moon is moving through these crossroads point. There are so many possibilities here and intentionally I leave it open, uh, if not just for the sake of time, because I know we're basically out of it, um, but also because I am, as I keep harping on, a huge believer in experimentation and the imagination and creativity, especially as it comes to astrology. So with that, I'm gonna end the presentation to try to leave some room for questions if there are any. Um, you can find me at Star Night Dwell on most things, including Instagram, on Pinterest, and my blog spot is up at the moment, which is the same name, just with blog spot tagged at the end of it, as my website is currently uh, under some renovations. But I hope that y'all got something from this. Please, if you have any questions, Put them in the chat box. Oh, thank you so much, Jay. That was really, really amazing. Um, I just had one very small question. Um, what was the name of the nakshatra associated with Kali again? Sorry, I wanted to take a note of it. Mula. Mula, that was it. Which um, means root. In, in Sanskrit, it's, it's referring to the root. So if people are familiar with um, chakra systems, which a lot of that is like um, white people doing Indian Vedic stuff. Uh, but if, pe if people are familiar with the names of the chakras, the root chakra is referred to as muladhara. Mula being the same Sanskrit word for the root. So just to, to go on to a brief, the, the name is Mula, but also I'm, I'm pretty fascinated by the fact that the name of this nakshatra is Root, and 5,000 years ago, or for however long, thousands and thousands of years that uh, Vedic astrologers have been doing things with nakshatras, um, they were already aware that this was the portion of the sky, which was the root of the cosmos, right? Because this supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy is actually the root of the cosmos. Um, and it's what everything else is spinning around, this huge, huge black hole, which, you know, modern science has only come to recently in terms of observational science. But let's say the Vedic stages 5,000 years ago, we're like, oh, no, this is the root of the universe. Uh, and the deity we're going to ascribe to it is the dark mother, right? Um, in, in tropical astrology, this is found in Sagittarius. And in uh, sidereal astrology, this nakshatra is... Uh, late Scorpio, early Sagittarius.
I'm seeing a question. Thank you for this brilliant talk. My pleasure. If in a natal chart, a personal planet is conjunct one of the two gatekeepers, Antares or Sirius, would you consider this planet to be a bridge to them? If so, how would you go about accessing the Milky Way through that lens? That's a great question. Um, I don't want to go into a whole thing about fixed star magic right now because we just don't have the time. Um, I recently did a class, not to get too uh, pluggy my stuff, but I recently did a class at the Salem Summer Symposium on fixed star magic, which gets into some of the differences, uh, not only in doing fixed star magic, but the ways that we can look at a conjunction. And there are other ways, including uh, parents, for example, that we can see conjunctions in the chart, because especially for stars that are very far away from the ecliptic, it can be a little bit um, slightly dicier whether to say the planet is conjoined that or not. Uh, suffice it to say that I do think that it's fair to say that those planets which are close to either Antares or Sirius, Sirius, we could also say that part of the sky in general, you could use potentially as bridges to some Milky Way journeying to Oniric work. That planet might be an inroad for you. Um, my counseling astrologer mind is like, oh, I want to see what house it's in. I want to see what else is going on there. And obviously we don't have to get into all that. But if you have an astrologer or you know what you're doing with that stuff, also, you know, look and see the house that it's in. Look and see also the planet ruling that sign, uh, that house, all that sort of stuff. Um, that might be able to give you some more details on how to get into the nitty gritty of working with that magically. But Antares and Sirius being definitely asterisms that are associated with those crossing points for sure. No um, problem. I also have another question. Um, so if those two points that are almost opposed to each other are considered the gateways and Antares is a gateway more into the underworld and Sirius is more the rebirth point. Is that correct? It's, it isn't, you know, it's going to vary cross-culturally and this isn't something which, which is working with particular, like extremely particular points. That's why I, I actually really like the nakshatra and lunar mansion stuff because you're talking about uh, let's say 13 degrees of the 360 degree. I'm talking to an astrologically literate uh, audience. So I, I feel like I can explain some of this. Or I can talk about some of this stuff without getting into super deep explanations, but I like leaving it a little bit open because um, most of the cultures that are doing and talking about these things are doing naked eye observation right? So they're not necessarily looking at the very precise mathematical points in a computer generated chart that we would be or that most of us would be. So they're thinking about general regions of the sky, which lunar mansions and nakshatras are. You're talking about roughly 13 degrees in the 360 degree circle of the zodiac that we're looking at. So I prefer talking about the lunar mansions because they're general regions of the sky and they have certain asterisms that are associated with them and Taurus and Sirius being examples of them. But it's better to think of the open region, I think, rather than the particular asterism. That's sort of my take. So Antares would be um, not, would not be Mulla, but would be the, um, would be Jeshtha in the nakshatra system. But once again, Jeshtha is the nakshatra right before. So once again, we're talking about general regions so it's probably better to think of it, think of it as like the part of the sky that is Jeshtha, Mula, as well as Purvashada following it. 
because we also have to, and this is, we just don't have time to get into all of these details, but we also have to think about the difference between sidereal and tropical astrology as well, right? Which is its own tangent. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't think about the asterisms in particular, and especially not the mathematical points we use to represent them, um, but rather gen like open and more general regions of the sky. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. And of kind of building on, upon that, would you then say that the the kind of half of the zodiac from that area background to around where Sirius is has got then a more underworld kind of tone or vibe to yes. it? And yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. 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 And <clears throat> those those parts of the sky, the underworld tone, the, the crossing points, right? Which are not, once again, like these very precise places because there's many different astrologies and we're talking about many different cultures. It, it doesn't have that level of universality by any means. But those regions of the sky being very cross-culturally associated with the underworld sometimes more of an exit, sometimes more of an entrance. Also, that's gonna vary depending on what hemisphere you're in as well. That's that also another thing, just like tropical sidereal that we're not really getting into, but the differences between the hemispheres and that reversal of the summer and the winter solstice. And that's why vantage point and personal perspective is really important. Uh, because these are not very precise things we're talking about, but rather seeing that these points of crossing have these underworld associations with them. So, and 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 using that as our as our entrance way or exit, let's say. Perfect. Does anybody else have any more questions they would like to ask before we close the meeting? <laughs> How about it? Do you have any any additional points to add, JM? No, I think that, that I know it's a ton of information, and I'd love to go perhaps in a future talk go deeper into some of these different magical applications and like, I mean, there's just a lot here, but I hope that this was a good introduction, at least, or like a good. Uh, as I said, jumping off or exiting point, whatever uh, part of the road you might happen to be on in your life or in your magical journey. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Happy to have you here. Thank you so much, Jam. That was really, really amazing. And I look forward to kind of going back through it all and studying it more in depth. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining and coming watching the JM's talk. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. I'm gonna thank you everyone. Now. Thanks again, Jay. Take care.